So the last little bit of chapter 6, we're going to finally get to exactly where did these line spectra come from and what do they represent uh, within the atom. And that's because there were a few shortfalls in the theory that Bohr put forth, but it was a good place to start, right? He had some good ideas and it was a good starting point to think about uh, these energy level transitions that we were observing and think about discrete energy levels within the atom. So two shortfalls, and they're kind of big shortfalls um, for this theory, is that the first shortfall was, okay, I have this positively charged nucleus, and I have electrons that are at specific energy levels right around that nucleus. And these electrons are able to move back and forth between these energy levels. Well, how can electrons... Right, a negatively charged electron, how can electrons move between energy levels without crashing into the nucleus, right? What is stopping? What is stopping the electron, right, from going all the way down to the nucleus. So if here's n equals two, n equals one, why does the electron not stop there? Why doesn't the electron go straight to the nucleus because they're oppositely charged and immediately destroy the element, right? What keeps them from following all the way into the nucleus? And then number two, if we think about these electrons as orbiting the nucleus, which they were at that time, so here's the electron spinning around the nucleus, any orbiting body gradually loses momentum. And so when that electron loses momentum and slows down and slows down and slows down, again, the same thing should happen. It should get slow enough that it loses momentum and crashes into the nucleus and destroys the element. Again, that does not happen. So both of these shortfalls, right, are pretty big shortfalls. An electron can move between these energy levels, right, why does it stop? Why doesn't it just go right into the nucleus? And if an electron is orbiting the nucleus, if the electron is orbiting the nucleus, it should lose angular momentum and crash into the nucleus, destroying the atom. Right? Both would destroy the atom. And we know that doesn't happen because if that was happening, right, constantly all over us, elements would be decomposing and decaying and breaking down that is not happening. So quantum mechanics is what came along in the early 1930s to help us explain that theory that applies to some atomic particles, such as things like electrons. And so this is a really interesting time in this field to kind of think about, right? A lot of really big names, right? We already talked about Einstein, Max Planck, Bohr. Um, we're working on this problem and trying to answer this problem. And so it also is really interesting to think about how everyone else interpreted each other's work and how they used each other's work. So, right, the first one that we had was Planck. And Planck was talking about solids, and Planck said the energy of a solid, we can find that by determining that basically each solid has a quantum level available to it times Planck's constant times the frequency that solid is vibrating. Right, what frequency is that solid vibrating with? And then along came Einstein, who he took Planck's work, he took Planck's equation, and he said, well, I know light has a frequency, and if Planck could take frequency of a solid that it's vibrating and relate it to the energy of that solid, then why can't I take the energy of light and relate that to the frequency of that wavelength of right? Right, very important thing. So basically... De Broglie looked at both of these bodies of work, and he said, right, if light 
can have the properties of matter. All right, so basically Einstein said, because light has a frequency, I can take that frequency and relate it to the energy of light. So he took a property of matter and applied it to light. So if light can have the properties of matter, right, relating frequency to energy, right, why can't matter have the properties of light, right? Matter should have the properties of light. Basically saying that matter should also have wave characteristics. So kind of interesting how they all built upon each other. First Planck, then Einstein, then de Broglie. So de Broglie postulated that a particle with a specific mass and velocity, right, should have a wavelength of light associated with it, where the wavelength of light equals Planck's constant divided by the mass of that particle times the velocity of that particle for the de Broglie wavelength. So Planck looked at the frequency which a solid vibrates relating it to the energy. Einstein looked at that and said because light has a frequency, I can relate that to the energy as well. De Broglie said, well, what about taking properties of matter, right? It has mass, it has velocity, and applying that and giving it some properties of light, does it have a wavelength as well? And so using the De Broglie equation, right, let's take a look at this. So say something on our scale, something like a baseball. I throw a baseball about 60 miles an hour, right, 27 meters per second, and yeah, Based on that, this baseball has a wavelength associated with it. So you and I as well, we have a wavelength associated with us, except for we are much heavier and we're also moving much more slowly than that baseball. The only problem is this wavelength is so small, right? 1.7 times 10 to the minus 34 meters, whatever that means, right? An incredibly small number. That number is so small, we can't detect it. So things that have mass they do have a wavelength associated with them. In this case, with the things that are dealing on our scale, right, that wavelength is incredibly small. We will never be able to detect that wavelength. However, what about something like an electron? Electrons are incredibly small, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, an incredibly small number. Electrons have a wavelength on the scale of 1.22 times 10 to the minus meters or approximately 122 picometers. What's important about that number is now, right, that number is on a scale that we can work with, a scale that we can detect. And it also means that really small things like electrons, they have a wavelength. If they have a wavelength, they must behave like light. Remember, we can take light, we can take light in a microscope, for example, we can focus light based on the wavelength of light, and we can use that to magnify things. Well, if electrons have a wavelength, I should be able to also use that, right, to deal with and to work with electrons, treating them like a wave, treating them like I work with light. Based on that principle, we developed electron microscopy. So the first electron microscope was developed in 1933. So just like x-rays, which are part of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? Electrons also have a wavelength of light associated with them. The ability to magnify something in a traditional light microscope is limited to the wavelength of light that we're working with, right? We're working with something that's in the nanometer region and we can get maybe like a thousand fold magnification. Okay, now we're working with something in the picometer region with a wavelength of an electron. We can get a much greater magnification. And so here are just two examples of what you can see with an electron microscope, right? This time of year, people are dealing with allergies. It's because of things like pollen. Or if we wanna look at the head of this ant, for example, right? Electron microscopy can give you three million fold magnification because we're working with now
something that's got a wavelength much smaller than visible light. Another problem that was put forth at this time, and the guy that worked on it was Warner Heisenberg, was this uncertainty principle of, okay, if these electrons, right, they're really small, they're moving really fast, and they have a wavelength associated with them. So they're vibrating back and forth, right? They're moving back and forth in this wavelength. So Heisenberg, what he really wanted to know was where do these electrons exist? Where exactly in the nucleus are these electrons? And he spent a lot of time calculating where to find these electrons. And so he came up with the uncertainty principle that basically he decided through rounds of calculations that electrons are so small, electrons are so small, and moving so quickly, that the error in determining their location is much greater than the size of an electron itself. So basically, electrons are so small that just determining their location will forever change their momentum and any future location where they might be. So just because we knew where it was at one point in time does not mean we will know where it can be in the future. Instead of thinking of electrons as having a defined orbit with precise location, right, Heisenberg basically said we can't do that. We cannot say that because the error in that calculation is much larger than the actual size of the electron and the fact of actually detecting that Right, to be able to detect that electron, we're going to have to put energy into it, which would move that electron and forever kick it out of the orientation and the orbit that it was in. So we don't really know where electrons are, but we can provide uh, a relative region of space. And so that's what Heisenberg did in his uncertainty principle, that basically we looked at the momentum and the position of an electron and basically gave a probability of that. And so... For his work, Heisenberg won the Nobel Prize in Physics at the young age of 32, right? A pretty impressive accomplishment that many scientists spend their life trying to win and trying to reach that level of research. Uh, he published this paper in 1927 and at the young age of 25, 26, and was awarded the Nobel Prize a few years later at the age of 32. Pretty impressive accomplishment. So what we need to do, though, is we can no longer think of electrons having a defined region in space, defined orbitals, defined regions where they're orbiting the nucleus. Instead, we need to think of a, electrons as having a probability. And that's what Heisenberg and Schrodinger kind of put forth, is that there's a probability of where I can find an electron. I cannot say it's exactly in this orbit, in that position, but I can give you a 90% probability, right, I can give you a region in space that describes you have a 90% probability of finding an electron somewhere within this region of space. I can't say exactly where, exactly when, but it's 90% probability you're going to find it within this region. So it defined regions in space where we might find an electron. And so, right, Heisenberg, we cannot define an electron's orbit, right? There's too much error in that calculation and detecting that electron will forever change its orbit so we will never know where it is in the future. We can obtain, however, a probability of where that electron might be, right? Within a certain region. So Schrodinger looked at this probability and defined it with the expression of a wave function denoted psi and gave us the probability of finding that electron in a region of space as psi squared.
And so we can think of it as kind of a node in a string. That node in a string represents right, a certain region of space. So our quantum levels within the atom, I've got quantum level one, two, three, four, all the way up to infinity. I can think of these waves on a string much the same way. They define a certain region in space where I have a probability of finding that electron. So at our ground state, n equals one, right? There's the region of space that I have. At n equals two, I've got two different regions in space where I can expect to find an electron. n equals three, now I have three different regions in space where I might expect to find an electron. And the interesting thing you'll notice here is each time I go up a quantum level, I add a node. It's basically where the line crosses itself. A node is a region in space where you have zero probability of finding an electron. We go through a certain region where there's zero probability of finding that electron. So now, orbitals as we think of them today, S, P, D, and F orbitals, where those orbitals come from, where the shapes of those orbitals come from, right? They're just a mathematical formulation that tells us that defines a specific region. That specific region has a specific shape. S orbitals are spherical in shape. And that's because the calculation used to determine their 90% probability of where to find them, the output of that right? This is that distribution. So I've got 90% probability to find an electron in that region, right? That's a sphere. P orbitals are the next up in energy. They're kind of shaped like a peanut. But again, that region in shape that's defined, right, is a 90% probability. It's going to give us that next level up, right? We're now, here's the region in space where I might expect to find that electron. And we're going to talk about d orbitals and f orbitals uh, very briefly as well. But the important thing is that the shapes of these orbitals that we're going to talk about, s, p, d, and f, that's where they come from. They're giving us a probability, a 90% probability of where to find that electron. I cannot say it's exactly in this orbit, but I can define this region in space that's represented by the shapes of the orbitals that we know and we work with. So the important thing from today's lecture, we should definitely be able to determine the energy given a wavelength or frequency, um, understand how an electron can be excited and promoted to a higher energy state, right, an excited state. And when that electron relaxes back down to a lower energy or a ground state, how it does so. It does so by releasing energy in the form of a photon of light. So we need to understand those transitions. But next, we're going to talk about chapter seven. We're going to look at electron configurations. So we're going to get to the bottom of the rest of these orbitals, the shapes, how many electrons they can hold, and a little bit in more detail about each of these electrons that we've introduced today.